Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. In this video, I'm gonna give you five tips on how to make better live edge furniture, including material selection, design, and finishing, and boob sweat. Check it out. First tip when it comes to making anything with live edge is understanding if your wood's actually dry, which requires a basic understanding of moisture content. Is your wood dry or is it wet? For those of you who aren't familiar, moisture content is the amount of water that is in the wood. Now, when you buy kiln dried wood, it's pretty much gonna be ready to rock and roll and it should be nice and dry. If you're going that route, all you gotta do is bring it in your shop, let it acclimate for a couple weeks, and it should be ready to rock and roll. But if you're not buying it and you're like myself and you like to get cheap stuff from local guys who claim it's dry, you're gonna wanna go ahead and snag yourself up a moisture meter. Now I've got a couple linked down in the description that are some really good options. I do recommend though, if you're gonna go this route of just getting a nice expensive pinless meter from the beginning. <laughs> have this cool meter from uh, Lignomat, and it comes with this nice little chart here that shows you what settings to put it on for your specific type of wood. When you're buying slabs off of sketchy dudes on Craigslist, you wanna make sure when you go to pick them up, you take a block plane, or this is a smoothing plane with you, so you can use your meter properly. All you gotta do, give yourself a nice flat surface, and then this pinless meter like this one just lays on top. You set the wood type based on your chart, and here we're working with maple, so it's 55. Then we're gonna hit the read button. The scan is gonna give you a depth of three quarters of an inch. And as you can see here, right now it's reading at 11.8%, which is below 12% at three quarters of an inch, which means that I'm happy enough with it to flatten this thing up and use it for a piece of furniture. So what does that 11.8 mean? Well, there's moisture ratings for material types like uh, construction grade materials gotta be below 12%. Um, and furniture grade, you're typically looking for seven to 9% moisture content. The reason this is important is because, because wood expands and contracts. Um, the wetter the wood is, the more it's going to contract as it dries over time. That's why it's so important to buy kiln dried lumber. Now that you know your wood is dry enough and some guy on the street isn't ripping you off, you're gonna wanna go ahead and flatten your wood and sticker it in your shop, let it dry. Eh, I would say let it acclimate for about two to three weeks before you use it. So even though this wood's at 12%, it's still going to move, which brings me to my second tip, which is stabilizing the wood. I like to use either a beefy metal base, if you guys are familiar with my stuff, I use a lot of metal bases on slab furniture, or you can also use wood. So some people make C-channel inserts, uh, you can buy them. I actually made my own for this table specifically, and you can see here, it's just a piece of C-channel that I created some slots inside of it for wood to move. I learned insetting C-channel a few years ago from my friends up in Canada that do a lot of slab work. It's really, really cool. You essentially route some grooves. You're gonna inset some uh, threaded inserts into the wood and in the slots that are allowing for wood movement across the grain, you're going to be able to insert this piece of C-channel and help keep the wood flat. The reason we wanna keep it flat is because when you look at the graining of the wood on the end grain, you can see here how the end grain is going to wanna cup the wood this way. So by putting the C-channel in there, it just helps keep it nice and flat across. I like to use these button capped hex screws. That way they're nice and round. There's no jagged edge to catch you with a washer. So if you follow along, you probably recognize both of these tables because it brings me to my third tip, which is allow the wood to speak to you. Two ways that I like to do this a lot is by using the voids in the wood and allowing them to eccentricate, eccentricate, eccentric, to make your piece more beautiful. You see in classic furniture, defects are typically cut out or not used in, in whatever the piece is. And with live edge furniture, 
you have that opportunity. Now I love using inserts to do this, if you haven't noticed. But if you don't know what an insert is, come in a little closer. So these are what I mean by an insert. Essentially they're just inserted into the tabletop in order to add visual aesthetic. Here they're actually binding these two together and they look really cool and they're kind of functional. This is a more classic application of an insert, which is called a Dutchman or a bow tie or butterfly inlay. And I've actually got a video on my channel if you wanna see how to do one of these yourself, uh, you can check out, I got a link down below. This piece of furniture here specifically, this would, have, would never be used in classic furniture. So what I did was take the void and I let it become an accent in the piece and I filled it with these stainless steel bow ties, which I think made the piece just look absolutely incredible. So the classical application of a bow tie is to stabilize a crack in something like this. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to use another piece of wood or try to hide it or make it match because it's wider on the outside than it is at the center. It keeps the crack from pulling itself apart. Unlike on the zipper table where it's squares, those are just used for looks. You can essentially use any shape you want if it's wider on the outside than it is in the center and make a really, really cool visual uh, pop in your piece of furniture. Another awesome way to kind of let the material speak to you in your building process is to think of the voids in whatever you're making as an opportunity to fill those with something like epoxy. Now there's really popular ways of doing that right now, but I think a really, really cool opportunity to use epoxy in a build is in the way Matt Cremona did with his wall hanging cabinet. This is a really cool piece just because he essentially made his own panels with book matched slabs in black epoxy and then he cut them and used them in a more traditional sense. Now a really cool application for me personally was two projects I've done in the past three years that I happened to get into the project and let it dictate what I was gonna do with it. First being the collaboration build I did with my buddy Mike Montgomery at Modern Builds. So I'm gonna be getting some help today from my buddies John Malecki who's a great welder and is gonna be coaching me along on the base. Pair that with Brad Rodriguez from Fix This, Build That, who's actually done an epoxy resin table himself last summer out at the Maker Ranch in California. He enlisted me and Brad to do a large resin pour kind of coffee table with some cookies that he bought. So these olive wood cookies were really, really cool, but they weren't big enough to be one standalone piece. So instead, we filled all the dead space with epoxy and we kind of let the look of the slabs dictate the way the tabletop was going to look. The second example is the reason my channel exists today, basically, is the Live Edge River table I did with the kind of finger in it. Now, when I cut into that slab, I had no idea that that void would be there and I was planning on doing just a basic down the middle type of glass river. But lo and behold, that void was there and I had to make a design choice at that moment. So instead of trying to avoid that and cutting the table from the opposite side of the slab, I decided to incorporate it and it ended up being the entire reason that this piece is super unique. But before you get to doing any of those things, you need to make sure your material is prepped properly so you can apply the perfect finish. Put more effort into your finishing. Promise you'll see better results. And to start, you gotta prep the surface the right way. So here's a few tips. One, no bark. Get rid of the bark. Stop leaving bark. Bark continues to grow after the tree has been cut. Actually a properly dried piece of wood, the bark should be falling off of it. So shouldn't be there anyway. And then two, it's gonna to continue to die and fall off regardless. So you don't want a piece of bark falling off in a client's home. Just don't keep bark on your furniture. When I'm flattening slabs myself, I always start with 80 grit after the flattening. Now, I use my Rotex and I've got a lot of information in other videos on how to go about this. But a couple tips here are one, to start, mark the surface of whatever you're sanding with a pencil or a piece of chalk. Reason you do this is because one, it helps you not miss any areas on the table. And two, if you're going slow enough to remove the pencil, you're going slow enough to eliminate swirl marks. That's a rule of thumb, if you have thumbs. If you do have thumbs, give this video a thumbs up. 
This is a vacuum, and you want to be using a vacuum when you sand. It'll give you a better finish because you're removing particulate from the surface. So if you're wondering what a swirl mark is, it's the little pesky pigtail looking things that get left behind in your finish when you're going too fast. To help you see those pesky swirl marks, I like to use a low angle light like this. What it does is it casts a shadow from one side and kind of shows the swirl marks. And then if you need even more help seeing them, I use mineral spirits. What I'll do is I'll go in after I find some, I'll circle them, and then once the mineral spirit dries off, you know where your swirl mark is and you can focus on going a little bit slower back on that area. So for me, my favorite go-to slab finish is Rubio Monaco. Why? It's a single application and you only have to sand up to 120 grit. It is a two-part oil-based low VOC mix. You don't need a massive booth. Um, you don't need to spray it and you can hand apply it. Super simple um, and really easy to repair as well. Makes it easy on your client. If I'm not using Rubio, I'm using Endurovar by General Finishes. This is my go-to finish for pretty much everything else. If you don't have a nice safe shop that you can spray in, I would probably go with the hand applied finish. And if you guys are interested in more info on Rubio specifically, I've got a whole video on how I finish live edge slabs using Rubio. You can check that out at the link in the description or up in this card. And I've got links to all of my favorite finishes down below for you. That's a wrap on this one. If you guys have any tips on how you handle your live edge furniture, leave them down in the comments below. I've also got a playlist of every live edge furniture piece I've ever made a video on, queued up for you right here. And thank you one more time for tuning in. Go punch your next live edge project in the face and I'll see you on the next video. What's up Yins, welcome back to the shop. In this video, I'm gonna teach you five tips to making better live edge furniture, including material selection, finishing, and Oops, sweat.